Wow, what an intro. I assume my microphone works now because it said your mic is muted during the intro. So great. Uh, it's great. great to see everybody here. Thanks for being at this uh, very unique event. I just had a live uh, book signing on Sunday in Los Angeles, but you know, this is for people who couldn't make it to that. So I thank you all for being here. Uh, right now, this is sort of a, uh, a, a familiar setup for me because this is where I, I do, uh, I lecture in evolution from this very same spot when I teach evolution at Cornell. And uh, it's just, um, you know, normally it's similar to this where uh, my students have fallen asleep and they're not on camera. So I'm basically talking out to the ether just like now. So, <laughs> no, that's not true. The, it is nice to have you here. And uh, even if I can't see you, we have got a bunch of questions that were sent in. And they tell me, they, they meaning Christina, uh, who's my publicist off camera, is monitoring questions as they come in on the Facebook stream. But they've also gotten a whole bunch of questions at the um, uh, Premier website as well. So we can get to questions, but first let me say what I'm doing. You know, the, one of the most boring things you could imagine is watching someone sign his name hundreds of times over and over, especially without interaction. The live signings are nice because I get to see someone, shake their hand, take a picture. And, and so this, this is a little less intimate, but I thought of a way to make for a really special product. And even the people at Premier Collectibles don't know this because it literally dawned on me five minutes ago. And I, I did an example and it's going to be really sweet. So I'm signing book plates today. So all of those of you who ordered the book are going to get a, a book plate. And the book plate will be pasted inside of the book that you get. So my signature appears on the book plate, okay? It's got a little Hachette logo on it. And then I'll sign this as I have done over here. Here's my, I'm in the midst of it. Here's a pile of them. I'm already started. Okay, and then here's, here's the added really cool feature. About 10 years ago, my wife gave me this as a present, okay? It's an embosser. Have you ever seen one of these? And it says, it's got my initials on it, GWG. And it says, from the library of Greg Graffin. And it's a, a way to emboss into, and here we are in my library. So all these books here have the, the embosser on there. Well, after I sign it, I'm going to emboss it. So you will see when you get it, it will have a, an impression of the stamp from the library of Greg Graffin. It just adds that, you know, that extra thing. None of my other signatures will have that. So for all you collectors out there, maybe that'll make these even more interesting. Um, and if not, you know, you can just, um, when you see me in person, I'll sign your book again if you want, or with a different color. That'll make it rare too. So anyway, nice to have you here. Uh, let's get to some questions, shall we? Because that's really the only interactive aspect of this thing besides the announcement of the uh, embosser that I'll be using. Uh, okay, so Christina, are you going to, uh, sound out the questions. Oh, I sure will. I Look love at that. These. You can hear it. Yeah, I can hear great. you. All right. So, um, our first question is to write a rock memoir and why now? All right. So did I actually set out at the beginning to write a rock memoir? The question of why now is, I don't really consider that, you know, some people say like, why did you write this album now? Or why did you write this song now? And when you're asking a writer, you know, 
who's written hundreds of songs why now it's like that's all i've ever done so you could have asked me that any uh, hundreds of times and as far as uh, my book it's um you know i'm i have a history of writing books and i enjoy it when i can find the time it's just something i do uh the ability the privilege really to be able to write a book is um i would do it all the time if i didn't have all these other things going on in life so why now is is really just you can figure i had some time over covid uh we weren't on tour very much in fact we only did one tour really it was a live streaming event during the pandemic some of you may have seen it um that left a lot of time off the road to reflect and um to really sift through the attic and look look at my old artifacts from uh, a life that is uh, now 42 years in, in bad religion um, was a lot of life to look through. Um, and when I started to think about it, it wasn't really, it quickly be, did not become a rock memoir because I think rock memoirs, particularly punk rock memoirs, are really focused on some of the, um, what I would think are, you know, stereotypic elements of the genre. And I don't think when I looked at my life, I fit very many of the stereotypic uh, elements. I think, uh, in fact, it was a puzzle to me how I could be um, considered, uh, you know, as a, ver a veritable member of the punk community, except for the fact that I was there pretty close to the beginning and uh, all my best friends were punks and all the music that I wrote was punk but how to define that in a simplistic way didn't make any sense um, and hence there was a puzzle a paradox and that was partly what led to the title obviously and um, because of that it's a it's a very unusual rock memoir if you even put it into that category because I touched on things about my life, particularly, you know, I tried to write it in a literary style where the main character, myself, was placed into this uh, story, a story from the beginning. So a lot of the book has to do with the time before I met the guys in the band and the influences in my life that may have allowed me or, um, coerced me to look at the world in a unique perspective and uh, because of that uh, you know the half I'd say the first third of the book um, talks about um, my life before I even walked into that first rehearsal space uh, which was the living room of our drummer at the time uh, and um, met the guys who had become my lifelong partners in bad religion so anyway it was not it was not really a rock memoir, um, but the fact that uh, it details a lot of the years, particularly the year when uh, Bad Religion um, sort of existed through the, the lull in punk before the rebirth, the resurgence um, in the late 90s. Um, you know, I, I think that makes for an interesting tale and Hopefully, you'll find a, a lot of questions and uh, an exciting read when you look at it. Uh, what's next, Christine, yep. on the uh, question docket? Oh, wait. I'll Speaking of... Um, doing this, watch. Oh. Here's, here's a signature. And then you put this thing in there like this. See, then the emboss, you emboss it, and you won't be able to see it on camera, but now it's got the signature over the embossing. I mean, it's almost like oh, an official Congress, isn't yeah. it? It's just wonderful. <laughs> all right. So, all so right, what's on the speaking question? of the, um, your book and the process of writing the book, specific you'd like to call out as inspiration, or would you like to credit for um, being an author in this way? Because your other books aren't as there's personal aspects to them for sure but this is, is you go deep in this book anyone that that that, that 
gave you the courage to go so get so personal on it? Well, look, I've heard it said that, you know, it's courageous to be vulnerable, but you know, I'm, it's very nice for people to say that, but honestly, you know, if you're, if you accept the fact that human memory is fallible, you don't have to elevate people to that level. It's not an act of courage. Uh, it's an act of honesty. Now you may be cynical and say, oh, today is a dishonest age. Nobody is honest. And I don't blame you for feeling that way, but I don't think honesty should be seen as courageous. I think honesty should be just celebrated. What, what's missing in this world is not necessarily the honesty. What's missing is the humanity. Celebrate, you know, celebrate humans for what they are and recognize that memory is fallible and you don't hold someone to their memory you, because memory by definition is false. Memory is more equid. Memory is like a dream. You know, are you gonna hold someone, in, you know, for for what they dreamt? No. So if you're if you want to take a humanistic approach, you have to honor people as rounded individuals. And sometimes memory um, is rewritten. Sometimes uh, what you believed, your most cherished beliefs which are subject to rot and mold um, can change over time. And so I just think that when I explored my memory in this book, uh, it came across, came off the page as being, um, you know, emotionally honest. And I'm not embarrassed, you know, to say that there are times I was, I was frightened as a kid, I was scared. Um, uh, it's not embarrassing. It's not a sign of weakness and it's not a sign of courage. It's just an honest reflection of what I was feeling at the time. And, you know, likewise, when I say I was insulted or angry about something 30 years ago, it doesn't mean I'm angry today. It's just an honest reflection of, I remember those feelings as being acute. So, uh, who inspired me for that? You know, I guess as you will read in the pages, um, you know, it's just the other members of Graf and you, it's the other members of the family, um, that always, um, insisted on honesty and, um, trying to be, um, you know, communicative in an honest way and stick to the facts, man. You know, if you can think of uh, how you felt at that time, then try and be factual about it and don't try to elevate yourself to something you're not. And I think being around academics, as you will read in the book, that was my cultural milieu. That was my upbringing. Academics everywhere. We were professors' kids. And, um, you know, the academic um, milieu, the academic culture, is one that uh, conventionally, traditionally uh, stresses facts and, and being honest and not stealing from one another. And more importantly, not criticizing one another for what they think. So that's kind of the spirit that the book was written in. Do you, do you, um, do you, do you remember ever believing in God, Greg? Um, so the, the idea of God probably, uh, was told to me when I was young by my grandparents, obviously, I think as you'll read in the book, my mom made a conscious effort not to bring us to church. She was traumatized by the, by the church. And my dad was, we never really talked about it. He was in you know, he was more interested in, uh, you know, the, uh, he's a professor. So, you know, professors are not by and large in this country. Anyway, there's not, um, you know, the, the secular tradition of being a professor was intact in our household. So 
never really came up. But uh, I think very early on, um, you know, the idea of uh, someone watching over me at all times was uh, distasteful, uncomfortable, and I was really glad that I wasn't like my next door neighbors who had to go to church every Sunday. And uh, they were Catholics and they you know, had to confess uh, from time to time. And uh, I'll never forget one time we shot a <laughs> one. Now, this isn't in the book, but this just, like I said, sometimes I can ramble, but this just came into my head. One time we, like all kids do, me and my next door neighbors um, had a BB gun, you know, and my dad gave us this gun and he set up a shooting range in our basement of all places. So we would blast everything from little model paints to, you know, you remember those, uh, those, plastic models that you would assemble like of uh, ships or of cars. We'd assemble the models only to blast them apart in the shooting range as soon as they, as soon as the glue dried. But anyway, we thought one day we'd take the BB gun outside. And of course it was an impossible shot, but I saw a little sparrow up in the tree. It must have been 30 feet in the air. And I was 40 feet back. And I blasted the, I mean, perfect shot right through the chest of the poor little sparrow. The thing spun down and hit the ground. And of course, my buddy who lives next door, he couldn't believe it. He said, unbelievable. You got it right through the chest. His little sisters, he has three little sisters who were probably seven years old at the time, screamed at the top of their lungs, ran home crying tears streaming down their face, ran to their mother and dear old Ann Shannon next door came over and she said, she said, Arthur, that's my buddy next door, get to your room. Then she turned on me and said, God will get you for that, Greg. And I probably was in fourth grade at the time. And I looked at her and I'll never forget it. I just said, shut up. <laughs> I just told her to shut up. And my father was in the study with the windows open. He heard the whole thing go down. He came marching out, had, had nothing. So I was offended that she, she said that this, you know, omnipresent, omnipotent being up in the sky was watching me. And he, he will get me for this. That was very offensive. Even as a fourth grader, I knew that's just, that's bullshit. So I said, shut up to poor Ann Shannon. I love the lady. She's, you know, I should never have said that, but my dad marched out and he just grabbed me by the collar and said, Grego, march, two words. And that meant get your ass inside. You're grounded for a week. So um, that's a long winded way of saying even by fourth grade, I just knew that there was no way there was some omnipresent being watching over me. And I was pretty convinced, um, that there wasn't, because it wasn't emphasized in our household, I just didn't have much use for religion. So those were, those were some early memories. That so kind of the Let's ramble <laughs> on to another question. <laughs> the next question for, for sure. Um, love that, that story, by the way. Um, can we talk? Do we collide with oblivion upon, upon death? Wow, that's a really, that's a very uh, poetic question. I mean, afterlife colliding with the oblivion upon death. Um, first of all, the, the concept of the afterlife, um, is very difficult for me. I don't, and it's strange because I want to believe there's an afterlife. I, I'm very touched by people, loved ones who have died. You know, I visit their grave. It's like, what am I doing here? You know, but I think there's something about the living, the people who are alive 
who want to cherish the memory of those who are dead. And to me, that's the afterlife. So do we live on after death? The answer is yes, absolutely. You live on in the memory of the people who you have touched. And that gives, so that's really important. You know, that's a secular way of looking at it, but it gives you uh, an impetus. It gives you motivation then to be good to people around you. If you're not good to people around you, they're going to forget you quick. But if you are good to people around you, they, your legend will be good to their grandchildren and you will have a very healthy afterlife. So I don't think you collide with the oblivion, but if you've made any kind of impact, even if it's the simplest impact to your own children or to your family members, if you make a good impact, you do have, a, 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 there will be a sense of afterlife in the memory of those who live on. But in any material, you know, I'm a materialist, uh, and in any sense that there's something real after we die, um, I can't, I just can't conceive of it. So uh, I'm open to suggestions, but myself, I don't live my life with that uh, expectation. So while we're out here in the afterlife and talking about the great beyond, we uh, dive into, into the unknown for a minute. And um, any questions about this? Um, the um, Your prog rock influence, what you might be listening to today <laughs> in that realm. Come on. First of all, into the unknown, the question about, you know, because the image on into the unknown is actually oblivion. It's a picture of a planet that's shooting some kind of a, a beam into the ether. Uh, the idea of, so I guess it does interfinger with what we were just talking about the afterlife, but, but that album, the forgotten album of bad religion, um, you know, was really, it was really an experiment where, uh, you know, the punk rock scene was starting to disintegrate. And uh, we basically, Brett and I got together and wrote a bunch of songs and I got a new synthesizer and Brett got some new studio equipment. And uh, <laughs> the other guys in the band said, I'm not playing on this album. This is ridiculous. And they abandoned ship. And we hired two studio music, or they weren't even, what, that was really being generous, calling them studio musicians. We basically uh, got our friends who played, you know, progressive rock to be in the band. And we called it Bad Religion. So, you know, so it does, if you ever get a chance to listen to it, you're going to think, who in the hell influenced this album? But the truth is, as you'll read in the book, uh, some of, my earliest influences, and I know Brett as well, I can speak for him. You know, we were just kids in the 70s, and progressive rock was the alternative in the 70s. And a lot of the prog rock that I, I talk about in the book was stuff you wouldn't hear on the radio. So somehow that aesthetic was already ingrained. And I do, I do talk about it in here. Uh, you know, in the book, I... I talk about how, um, you know, as professors' kids, we were taught not to be like everyone else. You're taught that you want to stand out from the crowd. You want to use your most powerful asset, which is your brain, so that you don't just do what all the other kids do. So at a very young age, it was ingrained in us. And I, I'm not sure if I can speak for Brett on that. I'm not sure where his feeling of, of uh, you know, being an outsider, I'm not sure where that came from. But for me, it was ingrained, uh, you know, in the household. And prog rock solved that uh, for the 70s. For the 1970s, prog rock was really the uh, alternative music. So when I moved to L.A., I was 11 years old, but I had already 
amassed a big record collection that I brought with me from Wisconsin. Um, I even got to see one of my favorite bands, Yes, at the Milwaukee Auditorium, the arena as it was called back then, um, in 1976, before we moved to California. Uh, they, that same summer, wouldn't I know it, later on that summer we moved and Yes was still on tour, but it was way too daunting to go see them at the Forum uh, or wherever they were playing in L.A. because I didn't even, my, my mom wouldn't really uh, let us go out of the West Valley at that time. So that's where we settled. But um, the progressive rock of the 70s was the alternative. So when I met the guys only, uh, you know, in 1980, it was less than four years later. I was only 15 years old at the time, but but um, that that idea of of being an outsider, you know, not playing music that sounded like everything else, it was very natural to me, and it was natural to all the guys too. And punk rock that we were hearing on the radio at that time uh, on KROQ in Los Angeles was uh, helping us to um, discover a whole community of people who felt the same way, you know, not being like uh, not not being mainstream. So. Um, you know, I think it was just part of the natural upbringing, but it's a unique uh, story to go from prog rock uh, to punk rock. And today I would say I still listen to those albums because they're so uh, great. Those albums from Yes, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and uh, obviously my uh, love affair with Todd Rundgren is um, well known. Um, so I still listen to Todd. And um, you know, the, the stuff that never really made it uh, to mainstream radio. A uh, playlist from prog rock to punk rock. Uh, you could, uh, look, all you TV producers out there who are interested in, uh, <laughs> in doing a live show uh, where I go on a search <laughs> for the best prog rock band and uh, I produce them as a punk band, then we could do that. <laughs> I love a project. Um, we have a fun question here. Uh, everlasting indulgence from childhood that's, that still holds strong today. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Obviously, being a kid from Wisconsin, and uh, not only being the dairy capital of the world, but also, as far as I'm concerned, inventing the only truly indulgent form of ice cream called custard in Milwaukee, uh, I still indulge whenever I can in a, a homemade or a small batch uh, vanilla custard. And if you don't know what it is, mm. I refer you to cops in Milwaukee um, and there's a handful of other hand selected places in the country that can do custard uh, properly. And there is a whole slew of them that can't do it at all. And they think they're selling custard and it's, it's a disgrace, but um, <laughs> custard is the one indulgence that uh, I'm happy to say has, I've spread it to as many people as possible. Uh, and I will never shy away from uh, going to get custard. Uh, the second I land at Billy Mitchell Field in Milwaukee, we go to cops. So you know where to find me in Milwaukee, at least. Stalkers take note. <laughs> um, um, as a naturalist, a particular moment or moments that you remember, uh, like when you're on a hike or in nature is there a favorite moment you've had well i mean uh the idea that there's a favorite moment in nature um or a memorable one of course i've had many memorable ones you know the first time i set eyes on the grand canyon these kinds of things will always they will always be imprinted indelibly 
on one's memory. But um, for me, uh, you know, going in nature is a daily affair, uh, literally. I mean, I go on hikes, even though I don't call them hikes, I just always make time to go into a wooded area or in a desert region or uh, even a city park when we are touring the great cities of the world. Uh, it's become a part of life. And the observances that I, you know, I, I observe things. I look at the varieties of trees, plants, and uh, if it's in the desert, rocks and minerals, um, and the outcrops in a region. And uh, that's partly what you know, drove my study in geology and in zoology was to understand the world we live in. And, you know, is that, some might say it's uh, akin to a religious uh, ritual, going outside and being by myself. But, um, you know, I think it's also just, uh, it's healthy and it's something that um, is a mental exercise for me. So I don't really meditate um, I don't really know how. I'm sure uh, there are people who can teach me something in that world, but uh, I do uh, walk outside and make uh, nature observances every single day of my life. And so I'm never very far from a, my good pair of binoculars. And I'm that, you know, if you're in San Diego or something and you see those geeks on the side of the road looking at birds in the lagoon, that's me. <laughs> so, so be careful who you're honking at. <laughs> um, we've had this question regarding how do you balance being an author and a front man, a professor, and is there a um, advice? Do you have any on time management? So the idea of balancing my life is uh, no different really than anybody's uh, balance. You know, you, you, to be healthy, uh, you've got to be able to bite off that which you can chew and swallow and no more. And uh, so it may appear as though, you know, I'm a, I'm, some people say, how can you be a professor and a touring musician? Well, the answer is you can't at the same time but if you bite off small chunks you can do it so touring of course dominates my the time pressure that i have and uh touring is one of those things that any musician will tell you it can drive you crazy touring is is grueling and even though it looks like you're having the time of your life every night and there's people who love you which is um, one of the greatest privileges I can imagine. And I get to experience it and I never take it for granted, but it is, it's still exhausting. And uh, you have to, to do it well, you really have to build in time off the road as well. And that, if you're ever wondering why does bad religion take these breaks? Well, it's really because of this idea that you have to recharge and you have to experience, we all have rich lives that we do other things and you have to do some of those other things when you're not on tour and you have to rest. So for me, I've got a good balance of a uh, little bit of teaching and uh, touring and uh, writing and it's a constant juggle, but you take uh, months to do each one and then before you know it, the year is full and uh, you've got to build in plenty of time there to be at home as well. Um, can music instill societal change? Okay, this is a question I'm asked a lot. Can music change the world? Well, that's a little extreme. So this person asked a little bit more of a restricted question. Can music instill societal change? Well, so there's two easy ways to answer that. The, the easiest is to say, of course, if music 
gets disseminated and is popular, even if it's a subculture, a subgroup of a society, uh, then you've changed this, the complexion of the society in some way because everyone can talk about, you know, it's a, it's a, a meme, if you will, a, a shared idea uh, within the society. Um, so have you changed things? Yeah, you've, you've created a new topic, a new cultural norm, a new something they can talk about and share. Who knows what the what causes the the trajectory of a society to change? Nobody, you know. Sociology has not given us a formula yet to uh, figure out what causes a society to change. But certainly, being productive in a society, um, contributing ideas, contributing words, contributing. Uh, sounds. And in short, making art is a very um, important part of um, of a rich society. So, um, you know, I've, I consider it a tremendous privilege to be able to share that um, part of myself and to have people talking about it is is one of the greatest gifts. So I have to thank all of you for that. Uh, we have a, um, a, a fan who said that the process of life, so they want to say thank you for that. And, and if you could meet the 10 year old, what do you think he would think of the life you've led? So if I could meet the 10 year old Greg, yeah. um, what would, what would little, little 10 year old Greg well, think about? the old codger he sees in front of him. Yeah. He'd, first he'd say, say to the doctor. <laughs> he'd say, man, are you old? What happened, man? <laughs> That's what aging looks like. No, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to say, wow, what an inspiration you are. <laughs> you see, I'm rambling because I have no idea what I would have thought at this. When I was 10 years old here, I'll tell you who my heroes were among others. Uh, John Brockington, he's a running back for the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Muhammad Ali, because he said, I am the greatest. Um, and, you know, probably an, any number of, oh, Gor Gorman Thomas, he could hit home runs on the Brewers. Um, and any number of, of rock and roll stars of the day that I saw on the albums that I collected. So, you know, if you think about that, think about what the 10 year old is aspiring to, I would say that, you know, even though there've been stumbles along the way, I didn't get to be what I really wanted to be, which was a quarterback, you know, for the Green Bay Packers. But, you know, but I came pretty, I didn't even get to be like a prog rock superstar, but, uh, I'd say that I achieved my my goal and I of being a singer, and uh, that was something I can ever since probably second grade. How old are you in second? You're only like seven. So yeah, ever since second grade, I I just knew I wanted to be a singer, and I can only, you know, the fact that I achieved that was highly improbable. It was just as improbable as becoming a quarterback, but. Uh, because people helped me along the way, uh, and because I took advantage, you know, if people say like, how did you become what you are today? I, I can't take credit for all of that. I, I can't overstate that to people. It's, I think I had a, a singular purpose of wanting to be a singer, but so do millions of other people. And so how I, how I succeeded was, was based a lot on for just the fortuitous circumstances that I had nothing to do with. But what I will take credit for, and this is where a lot of people lose sight of what they can claim as credit or what they can take credit for and things they can't. 
if you're successful, there's so many factors that go into that success that you can't just pat yourself on the back completely. But the one thing I did and that a successful person can perhaps take credit for, I never, I never wavered on the desire to become a singer. And that's why, I, you know, that's the thing no one can take from you. I wrote that song called A Street Kid Named Desire. And, you know, a lot of people laugh because it's a goofy song. But the, but the words aren't goofy. And I think I was, just, I was just celebrating at that time that I never lost the desire to want to become uh, a singer. I never lost that desire. And be, a lot of people, you know, get, and I, I had plenty of opportunities for it to be beaten out of me because of disappointments. But if you don't lose the desire, you can, nobody can take that away from you. As they say, you can, you can always claim that uh, in your future success. Are there any plans for uh, another Greg Raffin solo photo? Oh, uh, well, a lot, we get a lot of questions about, will there be another folk album? And um, I can only say, I hope so. I mean, I love the genre. I love writing music. And uh, it's just, can we find that particular, you know, block of time? Can we find some time and the right elements to come together? So that I can take and take advantage of that opportunity and do another one, and I hope so. But thank you for for uh, waiting for it. I appreciate that. We've had quite a few questions um, from people saying, you know, when will Australia? When will Bad Religion be coming back to Massachusetts? Where's Bad Religion going to go? Ah, uh, yes. What's next for the band is, um, sorry, got an ice cube with that drink. Uh, we are going to be in Australia in February. We will be in Japan in March. And next year, plan we got plans, and uh, they aren't announced yet, but um, maybe we're coming to your town. So keep your eyes open. Good answer. Well done. Then I think we have time for like one or two more questions here. Are there um, any last questions? Last questions? I've got, I want to um, just show you what I've got to do. I'm signing those. I'm signing these. I'm signing these. <laughs> and I'm signing these. And I've already signed all of these. And like then I got to go gonna through need an assistant. and stand. You're going to need an embossing assistant. Maybe you should, you know, start embossing. Well, well, no, I want you all to know these are going to be hand embossed by yours truly. He's sweating. For I will you not people outsource out there. The, I will not. There's only one of these. This is a, there's only one. And it's in my hands and it shall be personally embossing your signature well my signature on your book uh why don't we wrap it up with a with with your handshakes um you better give that i didn't hear the end of that wrap it up with oh, what your, your thoughts on handshake question came, came in and wanted to know if we could discuss handshake do you feel the same way? Oh, well, I mean, the question is probably they're asking about the song called The Handshake. And um, The Handshake was written, if they're asking if I feel the same way about this, you know, how did I feel when I was uh, writing the song? Uh, you can interpret the song any way you like. Uh, but the, the song you know, the, the resounding memory of the song, of course, is uh, people remembered as handshakes are nothing but a subtle fuck you. 
Are we allowed to say that on here? Well, we did. Ed. Is there a delay? Can someone beep that out? Anyway, that's a lyric. As I tell all my kids, uh, you can swear if you're citing a lyric because that's art. Okay, that's true. Anyway, so the, the lyric is, handshakes are nothing but a subtle F you. Um, and so that, you know, that a lot of people love that. It sounds cynical. It sounds like, you know, a criticism of the times that it's only gotten more meaningful today, that there's no true gesture of a, of a person's word, you know, but, but the truth is that the song was written, uh, as a, you know, as I remember it, I, I wrote it more as a, as a meditation on what the band was going through at the time. Cause that was the album that we signed to a major label. And I talk about that in the book and, uh, you know, that the, the signature on the contract and the handshake went hand in hand, so to speak. So, so, uh, it was a reflection or a meditation. Those words were, you know, uh, a reflection on what the band was going through but you know it has uplifting parts to it it's not just a purely cynical song you know it says i believe in unity and i'm willing to compromise but i'm not gonna lie or sell my soul and so those words stick you know those are words to live by uh today as well as 30 years ago when the album came out Is uh, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave your fans with today? Final thought: We're gonna save a life, and it just might be yours. That was a joke, by the way. That was uh, taken from Doctor Oz, who lost the election last night, I think. But I always, I always thought, <laughs> I always thought that was one of the dumbest quotes I could possibly ever say. So. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to save your life, but hopefully you guys will take care of yourselves. Be good to each other. Enjoy the book. I really thank you all for being here and thank you so much for the years of support. You mean the world to me. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.